what we can do when we stand united. We are one with the world. We can make a brighter tomorrow. Together, make a change. It's our life. We can step back from what we know is right. So let's shine our light. Oh, let's shine our light. We won't listen to what they're saying. We know it's just love that we're giving to this place that we call our home. We can't change what's been done. But it's still our run. We are one, one with the world. Wow. We can make a brighter tomorrow. Together, make a change. Change. It's our life. Life. We can step back from what we know is right. So let's shine. Catalyzing Change Week 2024 is building the social innovation sector from the 6th to the 10th of May. Players of the social innovation sector, from knowledgeable academics paving new paths to government champions igniting policy shifts, have curated over 100 action-oriented sessions hosted from more than 30 countries in a mix of up to 6 languages. The outcomes of these sessions is intended to drive the development of a highly impactful sector. The goal of CCW 2024 is to tackle the challenges of the sector and embrace solutions that will bridge the gaps in policy, behaviors and mindsets through innovation and collaborative action. Let's create lasting change together. Register for CCW now and check out our events calendar at catalyzingchangeweek.catalyst2030.net. Hi everyone, welcome to our Compliance Conundrum collaboration session at CCW. If you could all include in the chat your name or organization where you, and where you are coming from, it would be great for us to know who is here. Um, I'll pass the word now to Caroline. Thank you, Inez, and hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining this session today. Uh, I feel like it's almost a bit of an anniversary because a year ago at Catalyzing Change Week, um, we first we had a session entitled The Compliance Conundrum. Can't remember the full title, but that's when we we kind of raised this this concept. And I, I don't think we can can claim uh the nomenclature of particularly compliance conundrum, but but we really kind of had a, a discussion. And you know, I think this group can consider last year as being a real impetus for us, a real catalyst. A, catalyst uh, for this group coming together that, that's going to present to you today. Um, and so we're quite excited that in the space of that year, I think we feel that we've made some um, real progress to getting quite concrete and tackling this issue that we're going to be talking about today. Um, we really want to hear from you. I think that's kind of our key goal uh, over the next hour. And so you will see, um, I think Innes is gonna be um, posting a few poll questions that, you know, at your leisure over the coming few minutes, if you would, wouldn't mind responding to. Um, and then also we are gonna be asking you just to share your experiences, your stories, your observations. Um, you can rest assured that they, they will not get lost after this meeting ends. You know, the, the purpose of, of this conversation and hopefully many more that we're gonna have over the course of the coming months and year, is that we are really going to lift these stories and be able to share them so to really kind of drill into kind of the this issue around compliance that we want to address. So um, please, as I say, do do uh, open up um, and, and, and share your thoughts with us. Uh, but first of all, you know, a little bit more detail about why this group has come together. Um, you know, our starting point uh, is this observation of the many challenges 
based by small national community-based civil society organizations, uh, particularly those in the global majority, um, and, and how hard it is for them to access funding and good quality funding. And despite calls for greater inclusion and fairer and more flexible funding, um, you know, we know they feel overlooked and they lack support and they really struggle even to gain visibility. And this is causing really acute frustration at the structural barriers that seem to persist and the sentiment that um, with demanding funder requirements and poor transparency, local initiatives are really hampered. And it all goes to reinforce this perception that um, civil society organizations operating at a more proximate local level are somehow less capable and more risky to fund. Now, there is an acknowledgement um, that as a sector, you know, we need to be accountable to our stakeholders and that includes funders. And I think there's also an acknowledgement that funders obviously have their own risk management responsibilities. But we also see that the prevailing compliance and due diligence requirements are seen as overly complex and fraught and seemingly rooted in this uh, fundamental lack of trust. So this is the compliance conundrum that we have perceived and we've come together uh, around. Um, and this consortium of organizations that we will be introducing you to um, is united in advocating for rigorous yet proportionate validation and due diligence processes um, so that we can better amplify and support society organizations um, and thereby really help an increasingly diverse array of funders to progress, to advance their locally led funding ambitions that we hear much about. So our vision is of trusted partnerships between funders and civil society organizations, empowering proximate organizations worldwide to break, and we want to break down these barriers of compliance and limited visibility to better serve CSOs in the global majority, and to enable the sector at large to be equipped to, um, to address the many chronic and overlapping crises that we all know we face, and to do so in a way that is equitable and that centers the voice of those most affected. So we see this as really being a structural change issue, changes in structures and systems, as well as, uh, you know, a mindset shift and a, and a shift in, in power dynamics. Um, so we will be sharing with you the goals and activities uh, of, of this group. But first, I wanted to hand to Dawit Desi, who is going to uh, position this work in the, in the broader context of some of the funding commitments that we or the commitments we've heard from, from funders um, in the international community. So over to you, Dawit. Well, thank you so much, Caroline, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the different time zone you're logging in. We really are happy that you're joining this uh, important conversation. And I think one of the things that we have to ask is why now? So and the fact that current funding practices has been a direct barrier to local civil society organizations, both for development as well as humanitarian efforts, is one that's known in everyone in this room and in everyone in this sector. And there were initiatives like the Grand Bargain going back all the way to 2016 collectively recognized that the importance of locally led development and committed to shifting funding practices to equate about 25%. And so far, eight years have passed past and yet progress remains frustratingly slow. And there's been numerous researches that have come out that have actually put a specific figure from 2.1% to around 4% that actually the amount that actually goes to uh, local organizations. And this highly significantly disconnects between the promises that are made and then the reality that exists. And the reason why this group came together is and to use the opportunity that exists is that there was a renewed commitment that was made by um, USAID and supported by uh, uh, quite a few of the, the um, bilateral donors. And I've put in the chat, just for your reference, the commitment that that was made. And most foundations that are based uh, in the US as, as well as Europe. And this recommitment to the original brand uh, <clears throat> Uh, bargain brings a sense of hope and urgency 
and to ensure that the past doesn't repeat itself, I think we're presented here and we have a unique opportunity from the learned past experiences in order to course correct and ensure that this time the commitments are fulfilled. And drawing from insights from both the civil society organizations, funders, we understand that the main hindrance are compliance and due diligence. So these collaborations aims to focus on seizing the opportunity and highlighting the works that are being done by Ringo, Shift the Power, wings and specially focused on the localization movement and by bringing together and leveraging the sector collective data, knowledge, tools, and network to bring a, an integrated ecosystem solution. And let me pass it to uh, my colleague Rose to, to give you in terms of the, the specific things that this collaboration is trying to do. Thank, thank you, Dawit. Um, so I'm going to just very briefly highlight um, the vision for this group. Uh, what is it that we're trying to achieve? Um, and then speak a little bit also just about specific activities or sets of activities that we're envisioning carrying out. And obviously the purpose of that, in addition to informing people who are in this group or in this uh, session is also to invite you know, your contribution in terms of where the priorities ought to be. So what are we trying to achieve? You know, what do we imagine um, the whole, the compliance and due diligence um, space will be looking like if we're successful uh, or as we go towards success and changing the system? So we really are looking to see or we'd expect to see an ecosystem of actors who are working to address compliance challenges, but in a, in a more coherent uh, and, 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 and joined way uni or unified way. Um, secondly, we would want to see, or we believe we will see if we're successful, just increased knowledge among funders and CSOs about the different uh, um, due diligence mechanisms and processes that exist right now, particularly on the CSO side, there's often a lot of confusion because every every different donor has their own due diligence requirements. Um, and then the third change that we hope to see is, of course, a significant increase among funders um, in accepting or adopting a streamlined compliance and due diligence systems and processes. Our dream is that um, there'll be one sort of standard accepted on, on you know, and that makes sense for CSOs as well as for funders. Uh, but obviously, it's a journey towards that. Um, and then another change that we, we're hoping to see is, of course, um, really lifting up or, or the, the existence of more uh, evidence-based uh, stories of impact and the difference that this more um, localized or locally led development uh, is yielding and, 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 and the benefits of um, making the compliance and, and due diligence processes easier. Does that really make a difference? And we, we believe it does, but we would need to capture um, the evidence and to be able to share those stories of, 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 of impact. And, and finally, we would hope to see um, CSOs really leverage technology um, to sim both simplify um, the, the compliance process, um, but as well as, as to learn and, and to share. So those are sort of the five broad uh, changes um, that we're envisioning. Now, how do we get there? Um, we, we have a whole set of activities are we imagining? Um, so don't let's not focus too much on the individual activities, but rather sort of the, the objective around which these activities are organized. And we have sort of four buckets of, of objectives, if you will. Um, and one, the first one is of course, increase knowledge and of existing due diligence processes uh, for both funders and CSOs. And here, just as an example of Act specific activities uh, that we we with we we want to do is to really map um, or review the existing due diligence processes uh, among funders. Obviously, we won't be able to look at every single funder that exists out there, but certainly the big ones or the ones that we know um, most commonly um, fund. Um, global majority organizations and to identify and the first. The reason for this is also to identify the duplicative requirements and, and, and also requirements that 
may be a barrier that may be really difficult for local organization to, to fulfill and therefore keep them uh, away from being able to access available funding. Uh, so that's just two examples of specific activities around the knowledge building. And then the second uh, uh, bucket um, objective is to increase fund acceptance and adoption of streamlined compliance and due diligence systems and processes. And again, here we have you know, a number of activities that we're envisaging, including, of course, really engaging uh, with funders um, of all sorts, initially uh, philanthropic funders who we think have uh, have progressed much further, I think, than uh, bilateral funders. But, you know, ultimately, we do want to be able to, 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 to touch and influence every type of funder. Um, we want to develop a standardized qualification process for compliance. So some people have used the term a passport um, so that you can kind of carry your due diligence um, from one funder to another and you don't have to, to keep doing this repetitive uh, process for each one of them. So the third uh, objective or um, sets of um, activities are re revolving around, you know, I think lifting up and sharing stories of the impact of delivered through um, locally led development and, and, and the simpler compliance. And here again, a uh, lot of knowledge building, you know, gathering and harvesting of, of impact stories um, and, and really sharing those through different uh, platforms and venues. Um, we would also want to have, right now we are calling it state of the ecosystem, a kind of, you know, flagship report, annual report highlighting, you know, success stories um, um, resulting from this change in, um, in the compliance requirements. And the final set of objectives uh, fall around the idea of leveraging technology. And here again, you know, we, we have a whole set of activities just as examples, you know, developing a digital, the digital infrastructure for compliance management that would be accessible to both funders and CSOs. And this is the idea of having sort of, you know, a standardized uh, uh, process. So there's one portal where uh, this due diligence can be carried out. Um, and another example is, of course, uh, providing capacity building support or training, uh, you know, around use of technology. Um, I think there's technology can be leveraged to make the process simpler. So again, you're, it's not a repetitive process. And once you've done it, maybe it's just updating um, some, some of the information rather than starting from scratch all the time. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's uh, what we're seeing ahead of us in terms of uh, the, the, the impact as well as the sorts of activities that uh, we have in mind. Thank you. Caroline? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Rose. So I think that the important question here is why us? So why, why these four organizations would be able to uh, address a question that, that has been challenging this sector for a long time? And one thing that I think there is an agreement or a consensus on, whether you're a CSO or a funder, is there is a lack of comprehensive solution to address uh, the systemic challenges that compliance faces. That's one. Two, when it comes to the localization effort, it poses a significant barrier to actually achieving the commitments made by funders, either it be uh, bilateral uh, as, as well as foundation funders. So the compliance conundrum collaboration, which, which uh, incorporates Catalyst 2030, Epic Africa, TechSoup, and Adesso, we, we are actually positioned and have a unique advantage in addressing this issue by leveraging our sectoral collective knowledge, tools, and networks that, that we have. So if you look at Catalyst 2030, for example, stands as an honest broker facilitating activities to harness collective action, to shaping new funding paradigms and nurturing an ecosystem as this catalyze and change week in itself is an example. So an Epic Africa serves as a crucial platform providing services, spaces, and tools uh, for connecting, learning, collaboration within the African civil society and the philanthropy ecosystem as a whole. And when it comes to 
TechSoup. It brings in expertise and in terms of due diligence, complies services with actually country specific contexts, both from CSOs and funder perspective. And they recently launched a, a step program that is serving as a foundation pillar for practical ablation of our collective efforts. When it comes to Adesso, it's been instrumental in spearheading several initiatives to spotlight the shortcoming of um, aid and development funding system, including that grand bargain in 2016. And out of that lived experience, it's been actively crafting um, some system level solutions to tackle challenges. And but one thing is at the heart of our collaboration lies this powerful belief that system change is only possible when all stakeholders are working towards a more streamlined and co-created approach to system level solution. And as we did a presentation in Wings, as we're having this conversation conversation this is where that you know input from everyone would be able to to, to produce uh, an integrated ecosystem that would benefit and have a flow of funds go to local organizations so let me pass that to you caroline thank you dawis and rose um you know I, I think that's given us a pretty substantial explanation of kind of what what this group is about and, and you know why we're motivated and I'm frankly quite excited by a topic that sounds very dry and dull but we think it's absolutely fundamental as you can tell and I, um so yeah. i did actually just want to note melvin chibole who has been pinned this whole time and it's not that we're not letting him speak we we love him speaking but he's lost his voice so um, <laughs> he should have been doing part of this presentation too um i won't make you say hi melvin unless you'd like to but he he heads up um tech soups work in africa is fundamental uh, to this uh, this collaboration also, and I think may appear in one of our breakout groups, right, Melvin? Um, um, so we would like to move now into breakouts for, I think, probably about 15 minutes, um, because, you know, I know some people are filled with horror by the idea of breakout groups, or maybe that's just me, um, but, you know, we think it is a, a nice opportunity to get into a smaller group and kind of um, tease out some of these these questions, because it's a, it's a big topic. Um, so Inez, I think is going to, she's got a, a great, uh, little link that she's going to share. She shared already. Thank you. Inez, in the chat. And that's a place that you can also start to answer some questions. Um, I think free text format, so we can really, you can really start to kind of express yourselves, um, and your, your experience. Um, but in the breakout group rooms, we're going to try to tackle three questions, but if we don't get through them all, that's fine. You know, whatever kind of is, is really getting the conversation going, that's what we want to hear from you all. Um, question number one is, what is your biggest pain point when it comes to compliance or due diligence um, that you've faced, either going through the process or, or as, you, as you understand or think about the kind of questions that you're asked? Have you experienced any changes to what you're asked when you go through due diligence, um, either for, for better, because funders are trying to reduce and, and minimize, or, or are you finding them actually increasing in terms of levels of, of a requirement that you what you have to go through and number three what specific types of support do you as civil society um need to enhance your risk management and compliance systems and and obviously this will take into account you know your specific operating context right um but really we're just interested to hear whatever that might look like money consultant support uh, unrestricted funding, flexible funding, multi-year funding, but really thinking more in terms of going through that due diligence process, what would help you, your organizations or, or par partner organizations that you work with really start to get through that in a, in a, a way, a, 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 a more frictionless way. I think Ines is going to post the question. Thank you, Ines. So you don't have to rely on just me um, having gone through those. Um, so I think we're going to split out into uh, breakout groups now. There'll be one of each of us um, in those meetings with you. Um, so see you shortly. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> I'm on mute, which it always happens. Um, I hope you all had great conversations. I was saying inevitably in my breakout, you know, everyone's getting right into the meat of things and then we're thrown back out and poor Nolan was, was cut off mid excellent sentence. But um. Uh, I don't know how many people are going to find their way back into the plenary um, now, so I think we'll just probably, looks like we haven't really got most people back, but um, not to worry. 
Um, maybe we could just it's not like you take over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd be delighted to. That's um, a bit selfish, though. Sorry. Well, um, Nicholas, you, you made the mistake of actually speaking up right now. So maybe seeing as you, we were in a breakout together, you could summarize because you, you, you were making some very interesting. Oh. So would you share kind of what we talked about? Wow. I heard that if you contribute in the, in the breakouts, you don't have to be re to do the readouts. But oh, no, that's basically, not <laughs> Nolan promised that, that he would uh, uh, inf inform me about the mythical um uh compliance equivalency uh tool which i'm very excited to have finally track down it's like a, a a white leopard so uh in our discussion we talked about barriers of um of funding for overhead um ngos uh get 10 percent. it's been increased to 15 i understand Whereas internationals can use NICRA and other types of mechanisms to get 35, 40%. Um, and that the other problem is we talked about was bringing, you know, building capacity uh, within local organizations to follow our protocols and our thing. But, but these protocols have been established, you know, someone steals $10,000 and we create a new rule but it's never taken away or reduced when, when a new rule comes out. So our risk tolerance is very low. I say our, cause I used to work there. Uh, I should probably stop doing that. Um, so risk tolerance is very low. Um, and as a result, um, groups don't get the opportunities they would. And there's simply not enough contract officers and agreement officers at USA to handle it. But, it just gives an unfair advantage because profit allows you to hire a full-time compliance officer, full-time business development advisor. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's an issue um, uh, that's a bit unfair. Trying to bridge um, the two, I think is important. Um, reporting uh, being, I think, a, a low hanging fruit because I could show you a slide deck of, of, of how several activities that are long closed have increased in pages their quarterly reporting over five years. And it goes from 20 pages to 200 by the end. So, you know, this is just hyperbole and it just expanded over, um, it just expanded during COVID. So that is a, something we're trying to recover from. I don't know if everyone learned lessons from COVID, especially about teleworking for certain types of activities like PEPFAR that have a lot of meetings and they need to, uh, you know, that makes it a lot easier. Um, what else did we talk about? Um, uh, the challenge of, of all of this compliance and teaching this compliance is that we create NGOs that, uh, and organizations that look like USAID, uh, PEPFAR being, you know, PEPFAR uh, donors, uh, uh, recipients uh, in Uganda get upwards of $20 million. That's what, we're, that's what we're looking for, a local organization getting $20 million. But if you look at them closely, they look just like USAID. They spend the same amount, if not more, on compliance, on reporting, and on keeping uh, uh, USA uh, from sleepless nights. So there has to be a way to bridge those, reduce compliance through these tools like Nolan is gonna share with me. Um, and uh, and uh, also through uh, local organizations and doing more uh, co-creation, which is something we did a lot of in Uganda and the development of uh, a rather useless document called the CDCS, but that's just my opinion. Uh, I think that kind of covers it. If I missed anything big, yeah, no, that was that was full of meat. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I wonder um, whether it's seeing as we're a smaller group now, whether it's just worth kind of opening it to the floor instead of um, you know going sort of breakout by breakout. And I'd love to hear other people's either reactions to what we've just heard or or your own conversations. What really struck you um, while while we were in the breakout sessions, or anything that's occurred to you since.
So please do feel free to come off mute, put up your hand, you know, however it works. Let me do ice breaking for my group and I'm going to volunteer people. <laughs> so in, in our group, we had um, Jane and Carmen and sorry, sorry, my, my voice. Um, okay, Dawit. Sorry, Caroline. We'll move, yeah. Jane, maybe you could... Um... Seeing as you just got name checked by Dawit. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of being voluntold uh, to jump in. Um, I, th I think that, um, you know, I talked a lot about the um, the things that our membership is really uh, confronted with all the time. And that's really just the lack of capacity um, in terms of navigating the, um, the, the funding landscape. And um, I think that, you know, they're put into this difficult position of having to fill in this arduous application, but then being told also that crowdfunding is not really a sustainable way of raising money. Um, yet, you know, where where do they where do they you know what are they meant to do when there is this acute need? So I think that there is that kind of con contradictory um, thing that they're be they're being told for what for one thing, um, and then Carmen talked about her experiences. Um, working uh, with US um, AID um, and just uh, how, you know, from my experience, that's also been the extreme end of um, filling in, uh, you know, dealing with the whole compliance and due diligence issues. And um, I'll let Carmen jump in uh, in case I've forgotten anything, but uh, I think that just, to, you know, we really sat on that whole um the, the the number one um, issue that's in this um, in the easy retro uh, discussion. Thank you, Jane. Carmen, go ahead, please. No, Jane, I think you you captured everything. Uh, we are just talking. You know, yes, if we talk about government agencies like USA as a founder or a private foundations. Uh, right or other type of funder that it's more like private and not related to any government uh, entity. Uh, you know, the rules and regulations, they change, you know, and, you know, the private uh, founders, you know, probably are more flexible um, in terms of, you know, compliance and rules and regulations. But also the threshold of the funding uh, in my opinion, drives, um, you know, this, this sea of uh, rules and regulations, right? Not, they are not all the same. They are not uh, a lot of them for each threshold. So obviously the, the you know, if we, in, 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 at least in USAID world, you, if you are above $250,000, um, yes, and more, <laughs> uh, you know, yes, there are a lot of rules and regulations that usually they are not set by USAID uh, by itself, but uh, they are set up by US government as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Brilliant. Um, Rose, maybe you could just raise a little bit that came up in your group. Ah uh, yeah, let me let me see our yes. So we focused our uh, on the last question uh, about the types of support that civil society organization may need to enhance their own risk management, um, and some of uh, the issues that came up were before we even started to talk about uh, the kinds of support uh, that organization needs. Um, it was how to think about our. our compliance and, and to think about risk management and just that whole idea of what is risk. Um, and we thought that there's need to kind of broaden uh, broaden the, 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 the concept or the framing of risk so that in a way, even if it's not a funder that's requiring that you manage risk, you, you still have risk. So they, it's kind of a way of thinking. And, you know, so what do organizations need, not just so that they can 
be compliant with a certain funder, but for their own, even if they were financing their own organization themselves, there's still risk that they would consider. And one such risk uh, uh, we, 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 we discussed is around sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. So how are you going to sustain your, your organization? If, if you're a business, business people worry about how am I going to make profit, right? And keep making profit. So I can grow my organization, otherwise it's not viable. So I think on the on the uh, CSO side is how do I sustain my organization? And one way to sustain the organization is obviously to demonstrate impact. And to demonstrate impact, you have to have the kind of funding that we often don't see, which is what we have is short term. So in when organizations then think of even the kind of money they're trying to to raise then you know you want to make sure that you you have a kind of a portfolio and that you have long term long term um money that can enable you to actually show impact because that's the only way to be sustainable then we also talked about certain financial risks um which is where i think most uh, funders come in um they want to know uh about how you're going to make sure that the money is used properly. Uh, but we thought that it's there's a need to expand the definition of even financial risk. So yes, there's the loss of money and type of concern, and that's about systems, um, which are not difficult to put in. Again, if you're funded, to, if you have money to do that, like hire a good accountant and have, have a good system internally. But also, I think there's a need to expand the idea of, 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 of risks to one of elevated sort of a strategic concern, like how are you going to ensure financial health and that of your organization? Uh, and that's related to the sustainability. Um, and then the, the third uh, set of risks that we talked about are around data and, 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 and data privacy, data protection, um, as we're now in this age of... <laughs> Uh, where we are with technology, um, and that you know, CSOs really need to to upskill, uh, both in terms of understanding uh, technology, using technology, uh, and obviously mitigating all the risks that are associated with that. So this is an area where we feel that you know um, a lot of support is needed. Mm -hmm. So I think in general, our where we were leaning towards is that. The, the, the idea of risk needs to be expanded and elevated to a strategic strategic question. And it's, then what people need is not just a two week training or one week training. It's really kind of a way of thinking and and continuously, you know, addressing those issues. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's a very rich um, discussion you clearly had. And you know, the issue of risk you're get, you're getting a lot of kind of thumbs up in the chat there. Um, mm. that, that really resonates. And and I think also just to add, you know whose risk because you know it's very much sort of the donor managing their risk downwards and not mm -hmm. thinking about what that risk looks the other risks that the organization is is confronting yeah um in the context in which they're operating um and in fact you know sometimes by de-risking in, in various ways you're actually putting those people at greater security risks mm -hmm. so you know how, how does that look more equitable and, and, and how can that be raised mm. um but in the last few minutes um melvin are you able to kind of bring the conversation from your group or maybe you can nominate somebody uh, if you're too hoarse to speak. Yeah, perhaps I'd nominate Chilande Kit. Anyone of you would want to take a stab if not, I can attempt. Sure, I'm happy to jump in. Um, and Shilande would love your um, your support on anything I miss. Um, we talked a bit about how, um, in my recent experience uh, leading a program uh, in emergency response in Northeast Nigeria, there was fitting into pre-existing conditions of donors um, was prevented us from being as creative as we ultimately really needed to be. There was a necessity for that um, in applying language services, incorporating languages that were otherwise not being uh, at all recognized in communications. Um, and yet, because there was so little representation of those voices already, it was not on the radar of donors. It was not considered as essential as other priorities. Um, and, and then of course, the lack of um, the the timelines of reporting and expectations of 
impact um, to be assessed and measured according to external metrics uh, on, on a short timeline when we're really talking about a much longer timeline if we want to, um, to more deeply uh, understand and represent the experience of communities um, and and what's actually coming out of locally led development, very different um, timeline. So that was that was some of what um, we shared. Chalande, what else do you remember? Thank you. Yes, um, as usual, time was 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 little, but one of the ones that we could we also spotlighted was just the barriers to just entering the, the, the game in the first place. Um, a, a chunk of some of the work that uh, we do is creating these local coalitions um, with, with the intention that after, you know, they go to an accelerator program with the intention that after three years, they are ready to, uh, potentially ready to be funded directly um, by big philanthropy and bilaterals ideally. And just the idea that this is a coalition of multidisciplinary actors it's you know most funders have not even expanded the definition of who are the key players who are the actors on the ground that they can work with so we have um been you know a door has been shut on us just at at entry at hello you know they said no no no, we don't even understand what this is and i think this is the same case for other innovations that have come up in the global majority around you know movements that are being built around people that have a strong cause um, that kind of thing. So just the definition of who they can fund um, so that you have to come together, look, you know, put yourself together in a certain way. And then you have to get this one specific, um, you know, <laughs> uh, in the case of American philanthropies, you have to get this, you know, either 501c3 or you have to get this equivalency determination. And that in itself, that process then means that a lot of causes um, delay in getting the kind of resources that they need uh, to do the work that they do. So just to add on to that. Thank you. And, you know, and sadly, we've got one minute left. And just as I think the conversation is starting to really evolve and, and we're getting a lot of um, rich um, insights, but thank you all for them. Um, as I say, you know, this is the beginning of the conversation. We hope we'll continue next year. We will no doubt be here and, and updating if we haven't spoken to you before. Um, but please do engage, um, you know, and we will be reaching out, I'm, I'm sure, to make sure that that happens. Um, Ines, do I need to be saying anything else as we close out here? No. Thank you, everyone. No. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, team. Thank, Thank, Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Thank okay. you. Thank yes. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.